our key concepts for directing. Uh, as we begin that unit, one, I want to define the definition of today's director. Reasons for the modern director. Who's credited with being the first director? What are the functions of the director? Responsibilities of the director. This is the point at which I want to talk about stage management and the kinds of modern directors. Ready to get started. When we began our unit on acting, I spent time going over the brief history of the actor. Um, I'm not going to do that with directors because it's a relatively new position. Uh, the job of director as we see it today didn't really exist until, until well, about 150 years ago. Uh, it is in the 1840s that we see the first person being credited with being the director. Um, and that's with today's definition. Uh, prior to today, uh, the director was simply the person who was in charge. Uh, that would be the playwright, the head of an acting company, producer, um, who's the oldest group, who has the most experience. These were the people who got the title of director. But today's definition of a director is the person with aesthetic control without serving another function as an actor, writer, etc. Um, in the past, again, this was the person in charge, usually the writer. Um, aesthetic control means that the this is the director's job is to control the overall visual universe, the genre, the style of the play. They're the person who's making sure that there is a unified vision and that everyone is working for the same goal. After hundreds of years, why would there be a reason to have this kind of person in charge, the person with aesthetic control? Well, it's a change, and it goes along with uh, the change in acting. When I was talking about different approaches to actor training, I spent a great deal of time talking about how plays were changing. Uh, and that happens to coincide with the need for a director. Realism. Again, it's realism. Uh, these are the kinds of plays where the characters have subtext, where their motivations, the reasons for what they're doing, are not always black and white. We're not dealing with melodrama anymore. Um, realism requires a single interpreter, someone who's making the decisions about the subtext what this play means, what each character's super objective is, where they're all heading. Um, and it requires an interpreter because of the style, but also sometimes the genre. There's also more characters on stage who are all important. Uh, this is a more ensemble kind of cast. And sometimes you need a referee. You need someone who's leading the way, who's um, kind of keeping everyone in agreement what the scene means, uh, what is the complication, the obstacle, um, etc. It is also with realism, with modern theater, that we start seeing what I call the isms. Um, it is during the 20th century that once we've reached realism, there's a lot of things happening with style in theater. Expressionism, symbolism. Um, if you were theater majors, you would be taking a course on style so that you would have visual uh, sense of what the style means, what the playwright is going for. It's at this time in the early 20th century that we see musical theater happening. Absurdist theater is a reaction to the wars. Um, because of all of these changes in style, again, you need one leader, one person who's going to function as a referee. Make sure that there's a unification of style. We call this the director's concept. 
The director's concept is the leading idea, the leading principle to every play. Uh, nowadays, even if it was originally written in realism, we often will change that style to make the play symbolic or impressionistic, etc. Um, unification of style or the overall visual and intellectual look or universe of the play is what the director's concept is responsible for, what, what the director is creating. Usually a director will come up with one or a few sentences to describe that and then you coordinate all the other artists, the designers, actors, um, so that there is a con consistent production look. You guys have seen this even though you don't realize it, but let me remind you, how many times have you seen or have you seen, probably have, a production of Shakespeare that is in a different time period than when the playwright originally wrote the play. Um, we call that time traveling Shakespeare and that's part of a director's concept. For example, if I wanted to do Romeo and Juliet 1968 in Atlanta, Georgia, that would be my director's concept. And of course, the time period, 1968 in Atlanta, Georgia, was the civil rights movement. So there's going to be visually a lot of things we can do with the concept and that visual universe of the play that is good for the play because it is a play about two families who do not get along. If you cast one family as African American, the other as Southern white family, you automatically have conflict that's in the play but also in Atlanta in 1968. So that is an example example of the director's concept, a director making those changes to the intellectual and the emotional settings of the play as well as the physical. And then it becomes your job as a director, again, to coordinate the artistic efforts of everyone involved. Most historians label Duke George II, the Duke of Saxe-Meiningen, as the first director. He's credited in most history books as being uh, the man who functioned as the first director. In parentheses I have the name Ludwig Kronig. That is his assistant. Uh, you might even consider him the first stage manager because he's the person there on a daily basis who's implementing a lot of the changes that the Duke was responsible for um, that give him that label of being the first director. Uh, you'll see I have four bulleted items here. Well, the Duke loved theater and he wanted to see a better quality theater and he also kind of understood that, hey, there's a change happening in theater. We're doing a lot of different kinds of plays. Wanted to contribute to that because he had a title and he had money. He was in a good place to uh, make these changes. He economically could handle it. So what he did is he was one of the first directors who eliminated stars or actors who had a line of business. Um, by stars I mean the same as today's stars. He decided he was going to use what we would call unknown actors and lines of business meant he was not going to hire actors who had perfected a character type. We would look at that as uh, typecasting today is what we call it, but that is in today less of the actors doing than the business of television and film. Back in the day, um, actors actually typecast themselves. They perfected a specific character type they would play basically that same character in every play. So if you had a lecherous, mean old man, there were actors who were perfect at playing that character. Now, what you got with that was the same character every time. So the Duke said, you know what, I'm going to use characters who do not, actors who do not come with baggage. They're not stars. When people come see them, they do not have any preconceived notion about these actors. They don't have lines of business. Again, it's what we call using an unknown actor today. 
Um, he's the guy who first interpreted the using the play, I mean, using uh, historical work research and insight um, to interpret the play. He figured out um, that if you were doing a play like uh, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, it worked a lot better if you tried to create that time period on stage. Um, there was a lot of archaeological information being made available at this time. The antiquarian movement was in full force and so he had a lot of information and could begin to create a world on stage. Um, when he was doing this, the people who were directing used really cookie cutter sets. In fact, most proscenium theaters had what they called a comedic set, a dramatic set, and an exterior set. And you could change furniture and move things around, but you didn't change the basic uh, wing and drop sets that indicated these three uh, genre and areas on stage. Um, again, it was a lot more cookie cutter. They didn't redo all of the set and the costumes for each play. He did. He wanted a unified vision. He wanted uh, Julius Caesar to look like it was Roman times with the steps in front of the court, in front of the Senate. Um, he wanted them to wear togas and what we thought were Roman costumes. He wanted to bring the audience into this universe of the play. Uh, he also is credited with the modern rehearsal process. I know this sounds really silly, but before the modern rehearsal process, there wasn't a scheduled, strict, step by step process for how you rehearse a play. Uh, some people were rehearsing, some people were not. If you had a smaller role, you didn't get paid until box office, so you couldn't afford to rehearse very much. You didn't have the time. Um, and it was kind of hit or miss who was prepared, who was not. There was um, a job in the theater of the prompter. The prompter was someone who stood between the stage and the audience and there would actually be a lowered box where they would cover that person. They would sit with a script in front of them. If you were an actor on stage who forgot your lines, you could glance at the prompter who would whisper them to you. And the audience accepted that actors did not always know their lines. But you know, again, realism. This director was aware of realism and that change and that audiences wanted more. He decided, you know what, if I pay everyone for rehearsals, everyone will rehearse and we'll have a much better production. Uh, the play will be better. Uh, from the very beginning, audiences will enjoy it. Um, so he's credited with doing that. Again, Ludwig Groening. Most historians believe he was there on a daily basis uh, deciding, hey, we're going to now read the play. Now we're going to decide where everyone's going to go and we're going to rehearse it so that every night every actor is using the same movement in the play. Um, this rehearsal process is something we still use today. That step by step we add sound, then we add lights, etc. costumes until opening night. And this is the beginning of what we have as the modern director's process. The rehearsal process um, and the director's process in rehearsals is really divided in half when it comes to function. Most directors have a very, I'm going to start with artists, <laughs> most directors have a very firm idea of how they interpret the play. Uh, today we have at our fingertips lots of information for research and analysis. We can research the playwright, how the play was originally received. 
we know our audiences, what is appropriate. I've talked at length about communication between the audience and the performers. And I think most directors, after they've done a couple of plays, realize if they have aesthetic, artistic sensibilities. Do they have an artistic way of moving people, interesting way of moving people around on the stage? Okay, all of that is the artsy stuff. Um, that's the stuff that when you are in um, a, a directing program, when you're in school, they're very much emphasizing all of those artistic parts of a play. Um, but the reality is, you can be a brilliant artist, but if you don't have hands-on, what we call more of a craftsperson ability, you're going to fail because in theater you are part of a collaborative art form in which there's a lot of different skill sets coming into play and as the director you oversee all of those people so as a craftsperson you must know you must have enough technical knowledge about all aspects of theater you have to know enough about lighting design, sound design, set de design to be able to communicate with those designers in order to get what you envision on stage um, not just what has to be there because the way the play is written but what is there for your artistic interpretation you must be organized, organized with time um, with what is due when you must be good at scheduling especially rehearsal time when you start a play it looks like you've got all of these hours in which to do um, your blocking and movement and for your actors to learn their lines but you must break that down for them and work through that because time uh, wasted is time you will regret have wasted have wasted uh, when you get up to the end of the play. Uh, people management. You need to know how to keep people collaborating, keep people in your, um, who are working for you feeling like they have a high sense of ownership. They see their art on stage as well. Um, sometimes you feel, I know I do, like I'm a cheerleader um, because I'm just keeping every. oh no, that'll look good, that'll work. And you just keep everybody working and solving problems together um, from the little to the big. You are that person who's that business CEO kind of person. The better you are as a director at functioning uh, as, uh, in a hands-on, practical, craftsperson way, the better your vision of your show uh, will work. So what are the basic responsibilities of the director? Well, your first responsibility is to establish that director's concept, that unifying vision. Uh, you need to be pretty solid on what you want your play to look, sound like, um, have that concept going in. You establish that concept during pre-production with all of your designers. Uh, that way you don't have, uh, say, a costume designer coming in to do Romeo and Juliet. and They're bringing in uh, sketches and thumbnail sketches about uh, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet in 1597 when you've chosen to do it in Atlanta 1968. That's what I mean about establishing that director's uh, concept. You also want to cast the production. Now the casting process is different whether you are working in professional theater, regional theater, amateur community theater, etc. Uh, by and large, the director has the final say-so in who, which uh, actor is cast in which role, although often in professional theater you will have a casting director and there might be a famous actor who's been cast in a major role uh, in the thoughts that that will uh, bring in audience members, so you're kind of stuck with them, but otherwise uh, we have closed and open auditions. Closed auditions 
uh, mean that you are not auditioning with a lot of other people there. You have an agent. You have uh, usually a casting director. You are given sides, by the way. Sides are portions of the script. Uh, you are given a few pages, and usually in a closed audition, you even have the opportunity to uh, prepare a little bit before you go in. Open auditions mean that this is for the less experienced actors. These auditions are held often for the smaller roles, and you do not have to have an agent. Uh, you uh, sometimes will even show up at a cattle call open audition, which means really anyone, whether you have a resume at all, you can go in and have your 90 seconds to do your audition. Uh, so sometimes open auditions are great. That's how you find new talent. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen the talent shows that are so popular on television now. Uh, those are... Uh, similar to open auditions. Okay, when you're into the rehearsal process, you have as one of your first responsibility to block the play. Blocking means that you have prearranged movement on stage. Uh, where the actors go, when they sit, who they talk to, what they're physically doing on stage, that is the blocking. There's basically two ways to go about it. Some directors kind of mix it up. When a director says they're organically blocking, that means that they are working with the actors during the rehearsal process to figure out and decide what the movement is going to be. Pre-blocking means that the director has already made those choices and the blocking process is really for the director to communicate all of those choices to the actors. Um, it, it depends how big a cast. I'm certainly not going to show up with 38 actors waiting for me to decide for them what to do, I'm going to pre-block. I'm going to know with that many actors. I'm going to prepare. It depends on the experience of your actors. Um, I directed a show last semester where I had two very experienced actors and their scenes, we worked organically. In the scenes with the less experienced, my college students, I pre-blocked all of those scenes. So it just it's a, it's really about time management. How much time? Because organic blocking will always take more time than pre-blocking. But organic blocking to experienced actors um, is also part of their process for building their characters and learning and exploring. Um, Young beginning actors often find working that way to be overwhelming and scary. They would rather you just tell them where to go and then you find motivations for all of that during the rest of the rehearsal process. Um, but basically that's what blocking is. Now stage areas, there's a diagram in your textbook so look on the study guide for that page. Stage areas we use labels for those stage areas to make the communication process faster, easier. If you remember a couple of key, a uh, couple of key things, you will always be able to figure them out. Um, remember this: all stage area, all stage areas are determined from the point of view of the actor when they're on stage facing the audience. So the actor's right when they're on stage facing the audience is their right. It's their left. But if they were to turn their back to the audience, stage left would still be where it was when they were facing the audience. It does not change because it's from the actor's point of view, again, when they are facing the audience. So right always remains right. Left always remains left. If you are facing the stage, the sides of the stage, behind the stage, above the stage, right is always stage right, stage left is always stage left. At the time when these terms were being used regularly, 
Stages were often built on a rake, which means that they were built at an angle. So when you were further away from the audience, you were upstage. When you were closer to the audience, you were downstage. Uh, so that's where we get upstage, downstage. All stage areas are referred to by left, right, up, and down. So you can go up right, down, left, up stage center, the centermost point between right and left, up and down is center, so up center, would not be the ab absolute center, but it would be further away from the audience center stage. Uh, so just remember, again, acting uh, um, areas are from the point of view of the actor when they are facing the stage. Okay, there's a few terms here. These are some simple terms. Business on stage is what actors are doing. It is not the blocking. In other words, blocking is where you go. Business is what you do when you get there. You might sit down and begin knitting or reading a book. Maybe you're eating a meal. Uh, whatever those small things that actors do on stage, that is their business. Cross means to go from one side of the stage to another. Sometimes it's from one piece of furniture. I want you to cross from the sofa to the kitchen table. Um, off stage, yeah, it means when you're not being seen by the audience. But off stage does not necessarily mean you're not still a part of the show. Uh, you could be an off stage voice, off stage characters. I have had an actor in the audience who then comes on stage and becomes a part of the show. Um, pantomime is when you are acting without words or you are pretending that there are props there. Um, you will often see in shows where there's many different locations. You don't want to change the setting and the props completely for every single location or you would have a three hour show. So the actors pretend small props. They pretend to have a bottle of water and to drink. They pretend to knock on a door and open that door. That's pantomiming. And again, often in theater, pantomime is a term used for acting without words. It's not like mime <laughs> with the white face and the extravagant, you know, the exaggerated movements. We're talking pantomime. Um, basic fundamentals of composition, rhythm, picturization. Uh, composition is when you want, say, everyone's face to be seen on stage. You have to be aware of the composition so that actors are not all clumped up together or one actor in front of another. Your composition is to make the sight lines work so that everyone in the audience sees every actor as they need to. Picturization is when you go from one arrangement of actors on stage to another arrangement and that those arrangements of the actors in and of themselves tell a story. Every play should have peaks and valleys. There should be times when, oh, as an audience, you kind of catch your breath after maybe a really big scene where there was an argument. And then you have a calmer scene. And then maybe the scene becomes much more intention, um, emotionally intense. And that's what I mean by peaks and valleys. It creates an overall rhythm in your show. You should be reading Chapter 4. It talks about composition, uh, rhythm, etc., your primary goal as a director, do not forget, is to have the audience focusing on what you want them to focus on. Um, when you want them to focus on it, you don't want your audience to be looking at something else on stage that's more interesting than what you think should be the most interesting thing on stage. Because what you think is the most interesting is usually what's going to be pushing the plot Forward. So that's focus and keeping the audience focused where you want them to look at and pay attention to. That's really your main job. Um, an actor coaching, working with the actors to make sure they understand what you want them to do. 
uh, what you think their character, how you think their character would react, behave, etc. Um, actor coaching is a m big job for the director. And as the director, I am always functioning as a surrogate audience member, meaning I'm always trying to predict. How's the audience going to respond to this? Are they going to think this is funny or is it just us? Um, is the audience going to understand this? Can they see this? Um, looking at the play and trying to look at it as an audience member will really help in later rehearsals because you can give the audience, I mean you can give your actors more guidance as far as their intentions on stage whether that's obvious to an audience or not. Um, most important though, I think as a director, your most important job is to coordinate the artistic efforts of everyone involved. Make sure that your lighting designer, costume designer, your actors, everyone involved feels, like I said, a sense of ownership. This is a collaborative art form. This is an art form that should be... Um, Everybody should be able to look at the play and point to something and say, oh, I did that. I'm responsible for this. If everyone works together and they're working all for the same goal, it improves the quality of your production. And it's, you know what, it's what's fun about doing theater. I've never understood. I have friends who are still active in the theater and they aren't having fun anymore because they're just working so hard and I've got to get this and I've got to get this and I'm like, you know, why don't you let somebody else have some say-so and artistic input and you won't be so stressed out and you know what? Everybody will enjoy it and it'll be a better play because again, it's the collaborative art. One of the things that Ludwig Kronig and the Duke of Saxe-Meiningen uh, did that gives them the label of being the first is creating a rehearsal process. Well, it is the stage manager who's really in charge of all of that. Uh, the stage manager is kind of the unsung hero of a play because they are overseeing and keeping everybody to a schedule organizing etc they are the person who um, c communicates with the director and the designers w between production meetings etc when the director is with those designers they kind of keep everything going um, they're like any manager of any retail store restaurant etc um, in theater, they're the person in charge of the production throughout pre-production, rehearsal, performance. Uh, they keep lists. They keep dates. Um, they take notes in every meeting. Uh, they're the facilitator and main conduit of communication for the production, um, especially between the performers and technicians. During rehearsals, they keep a rehearsal report so that they can send that uh, to every designer, props person, so that everyone knows what decisions have been made that night of rehearsal that might affect them. You know, they, we might decide, hey, we really need to have two ashtrays on stage instead of one. One's going to be downstage left. One will still be on the end table next to the sofa. Okay, it is your stage manager who's going to make note of that in the rehearsal log and make sure everybody is sent that information. Uh, they're a non-creative person. It's a managerial job. The stage manager is not allowed to give suggestions to actors. They are not allowed to interfere with a director working with the actors. They're the go-between. Uh, this is a job, however, that most professional directors do and use to learn before they become a professional director. 
uh, most directors work in stage management. When the show is rehearsed and it's in performance, it is the stage manager who's in a booth with headphones, microphone, and they are what we call calling the show. You know, there's light cues, sound cues. Cues are when something happens. You know, so there might be a doorbell ring. So you as a stage manager have numbered all of your sound cues, your um, light cues. So you might be getting ready to have an actor enter the stage. Uh, the doorbell rings. Uh, you will call, you know, sound cue E, light cue 2B. And then those things happen on stage. So you do that throughout the show as a stage manager. You are calling all of that. There are times you are even telling the actors when they enter because they can't see what's happening on stage. Um, you also keep a copy of the script uh, prompt book. Uh, it's called the show Bible. It's where all the information about the play is in that prompt book. It's a copy of the script with everybody's movement, with any line changes. You have all of your cues. You have a cueing script, copies of the props, the sound, all those lists, etc. The idea behind a prompt book, sometimes it's called the show Bible, is that you could turn that over to your assistant. And that assistant would be able to run the show because you've got all the cues marked to the specific part in the script when they happen. Um, in theater, this is one of the most lucrative jobs because there is so much responsibility. In professional theater, when the show is up and running, the designers, the stage managers, they don't stick around. They move on to their next job. So you're the boss. You're the person who makes sure everybody's getting paid. If something's broken, it gets fixed. If there is maintenance to do on costumes, etc., you're the person who's making sure that there are dressers and that there are maintenance crew so that the show continues to go on without the director and the designers. Again, it's the unsung hero in stage management. And it's always very difficult sometimes for high school stage managers to move to college because in high school, the students are still going to their teacher to ask questions. And I make all of my students go to their stage manager first because I'm trying really hard to get high schooler age students to get used to that responsibility. Not only having that responsibility, but having a peer who has that much responsibility over you. I want to talk about labels. When you've been a director for a while, um, you get a reputation for being particularly good at some of the different functions and artistry of being a director, so you get a label. Um, an actor's director is a director that has a reputation for being really good at working with actors, their interpretation, uh, keeping the actors on task. Um, actors really want to work with this kind of director because that an actor's director really is in tune to their needs as an actor creating that character. A director's director is a director who gets a lot of respect from other directors. Um, you might think of someone like Julie Taymor who did The Lion's King on Broadway. She is thought of as a director's director because she figured out how to transform that animated musical to a stage musical and did it in a collaborative, beautiful way that not only did the audience really enjoy the show, but other directors looked at her work and went, wow, how did she get the puppetry, costuming, makeup, it all works so well together. She's good at working in a collaborative atmosphere and getting other people to be super creative. The movement on stage and off, um, again, that's a director's director, someone who's very creative 
and thinks a little differently and mainly other directors get it. A playwright's director is a director who has a reputation for trying to do a play exactly as the playwright intended it to be. They do a lot of research into what did the playwright think about their play? What do, what do they say it means? You know, how do I do this play and be true to every word? They're directors who also work really well with new plays, with playwrights when they are in the process. I talked about uh, playwriting and workshopping and that in theater it's a different process. You don't have an editor who just comes in and edits your work. You test your work out and the way to do that is through those festivals and workshops and a playwright's director is someone who is a part of that workshopping process. An auteur director is a director who's kind of the opposite of the playwright's director in that they feel that a playwright's script is a jumping off point. They like to deconstruct a play, take it apart, every word, every meaning, and then maybe put it back together and it no longer quite represents what the playwright wanted it to represent. It now represents the director's concept. Um, a lot of auteur directors are very visually inspired, um, image driven. They are directors who really, um, like I said, they have a vision. It's their vision. They like to work in public domain where they are not beholding to copyright and they do not have to do the playwright's words the way that they were written. Uh, today there is a position in the theater too called the dramaturg. The dramaturg is the person who specializes in cultural social research that is part of um, research for doing a play. They specialize in theater background and, and what was happening at different times in theater's history, what plays looked, sounded like, and what is pertinent to current plays. A lot of regional theaters have a dramaturg on staff. They have someone on staff whose job it is to help a young playwright, to help a new playwright if they want to know, hey, what did Atlanta look like? What were the main streets? What was the architecture like? They can send the dramaturg off to do that research to find out that information so that the writer continues on doing their work and they don't have to be bothered with a lot of what is uh, research and which can sometimes be very tedious. Dramaturgs are becoming more and more important in the theater though because in modern theater as directors we try really hard to do older plays in a context that makes them much more pertinent to a modern audience, meaningful to a uh, modern audience. So sometimes using a dramaturg to focus in on a specific time period in history will really give you time to focus on other aspects of your play.